Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I'm excited to be here with Whitney Nicole from Songbird Studios and the creator of The Singing Straw. We're going to get into all of that in a minute because this woman is a powerhouse. She has done so much as a musician and as an entrepreneur. Um, we'll get into that in a minute, but I want to know a little bit about your journey, Whitney. I'd love to, f- to know like how you got started in music and how that kind of blossomed into all these sides of your business that you have going on. Thank you so much, Brie, for having me. This is really exciting. I love to talk about my journey and sort of like my goal in life is just to inspire as many singers to just own and artists to own their voice as possible. So I love being here and I love what you're doing. So thank you for having me. <laughs> Yay, I'm so excited that we finally made this happen. Definitely, definitely. So my journey actually starts out like I have always been a singer. I love, love to sing. And I came out of the womb singing um, as a kid. And ultimately, I um, grew up, my parents were super supportive, but also grounded in reality. And they always had this sort of like underlying, well, you make sure that you have a real job. You know, this music is great. And, you know, we love your artistic expression, but it's really not likely that you're going to be creating a business out of it. So let's make sure that, you know, you, uh, my dad was a doctor. And at first I thought maybe I'd go that route. I actually went to Yale and studied political science thinking that I would, uh, go, you know, become a lawyer after that. So I, I had the sort of like, you know, the plan, the, the grounded, you know, responsible plan, if you will, but I always sang alongside that. And so I sang as a kid, I sang through college and I I graduated and moved to New York city. Um, and I started working in a law firm, but I, within a few months was kind of like feeling a little unfulfilled, if you will. And so I, so did you go get your law degree? Like you went that far or you were, I did not. I got a political science degree, took the LSAT Mm. and Ah. worked as a paralegal. I was sort of going to take like one to two years to work as paralegal and then go to law school Mm. after that. So I, in the middle of that though, I decided, you know, why don't I just take a year and pursue my music? Cause I'm young. And like, if I don't do it now, I'll regret it. So I just put a little pause, uh, on that. And I, um, and started a band and started gigging in New York. And then the rest is history. I mean, it was just like (laughs) like, like, the entire thing. I love that though. That (laughs) That was so smart that you did that because once you go down that path, you know, it's hard to turn back, especially if you like invested all this money and becoming a lawyer. And then you go to do the work and you're like, "Eh, it wasn't really what I was thinking. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, I think I know people who are meant to be lawyers and I think that you can change the world that way. You know, if you do, if that's your passion, but for me, I was in that, you know, that, the law firm working and it was like, I just felt like it was so like mind numbingly, soul numbingly, like there wasn't any change happening. And I don't think that is across the board for all like legal professions at all. It just, for me, it did not line up. And so I, I'm really glad that I took that, you know, pause because it changed the direction of my whole life. For sure. That was, that was really smart. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So I ended up doing a lot of gigging and uh, started a band in New York. And then I, um, you know, released an album. I basically then moved to California and started teaching voice at the same time and worked on my own first sort of debut album. Um, and then sort of that snowballed into, I did a little bit of touring around it. I released it. Um, and at the same time was growing my teaching business, which ultimately led to how like sort of songbird studios came about. Um, and you know, that has become, you know, my love, my baby, my life, like my first child, essentially. (laughs) Wow. So what, what year did you move to California? 
Oh my goodness. What year <laughs> did I move to California? I think 2009, 2009 sounds about right. 2010. And, um, I think my, yeah, I mean, it's funny because you look back and it all kind of m- melds together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was teaching on my own for probably the first three or four years. Um, and that was just like under my name. And I was teaching alongside while I was performing and sort of like, you know, I was looking for ways to support myself while I pursued my artistry and pursued my music because I knew that I wanted to write music and I knew I wanted to perform it. And I just didn't know what exactly my life was going to look like. But I just thought I'll follow what it makes me feel good right now and what I'm really passionate about. And um, it was kind of funny because I... Uh, growing up, I was singing all the time, but I, I didn't actually study voice in a traditional sense. Um, the lessons I had as a kid, I, I couldn't really, I didn't ever click with any of the teachers or the styles. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm like sort of a pop soul singer. I don't um, like classical was never my jam. I massively respect it, but it was just never my jam. And so my, my voice didn't fit in that way. And that was sort of the type of instruction I was introduced to at a younger age. And so I kind of was like, well, lessons aren't for me. Like this isn't, you know, <laughs> so it's kind of ironic that I, st- I came back to teaching and found that I was was, you know, when I first started teaching and, and working with students myself from a vocal coaching primarily perspective, I realized like it was actually very quick uh, after my first few lessons of realizing that, oh my gosh, like this is something I am like meant mm. to do. Like this is something I am so passionate about to see pe- other people step into their own voice and to s- help other people embrace like what they have authentically, like, and their sort of like unique voice. That for me was like, it, it, it happened alongside while I was doing my first full length album. But I remember kind of feeling like, oh my God, this is even more powerful than being on stage and sharing my own music. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a statement because I know of being a performing musician, like, I feel like there's almost nothing more powerful than that. So to find something that is, is like, wow, like ding, ding, like we have hit the jackpot here. Um, I'm curious, I wanted to go back to like the thing about classical training, because I feel like at least maybe at least where I was and like the people that I was around, like that was kind of the only way to train when you were younger. It's like, and I was classically trained and luckily my voice fits that. And it kind of ended up working out for me um, because I'm a, you know, a Christian pop kind of singer. Like I could make that work, but there are plenty of people that don't make, you know, it doesn't make sense for them to train classically. And I think that things have changed because I've now talked to a lot of voice teachers who are not approaching it from the classical direction. And do you think that, you know, over the past maybe 20, 30 years that things have really advanced as far as having voice teachers that can really help people in the style that they want to be singing in? Absolutely. And I think that is something, you know, so it's partly a progression over the last, you know, couple of decades for sure. And I think that different areas of the world progressed quicker than others. I know that a lot of, you know, my colleagues in Europe, like there, there was more contemporary instruction for them. And even in a, you know, an academic context, whereas Mm -hmm. in this, the U S there was less so, and it's been a slower move. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but I do, there's definitely been sort of like a door that has opened. And I think that now there is so much more acceptance and respect um, for teachers that do approach um, vocal health and just vocal technique from a contemporary standpoint. So, you know, when you get into the nerdiness of voice function, um, there isn't really a right or a wrong way. It's just that these different genres, uh, they, they mean that we're using our instrument in a different way, right? Our muscles, our certain muscle sets are more dominant or certain vowel shapes are more common in classical versus contemporary. There's a lot more uh, rigid structure around classical training. Um, not necessarily in a bad way, just like there's a lot more specifics of what like is expected of say an opera singer versus someone who's going to go out and release an album. You know, I don't, it doesn't really matter to me if Billie Eilish's vowels are perfect, right? <laughs> right. Like, it, it's like, who cares? So it's just, I think there is a move and it's really been very welcome. I think amongst, um, artists for sure. And then I, I know a lot of 
teachers now and organization, teacher organizations that bring together all of these teachers from different backgrounds. So it's less like, oh, this is the one way to teach. It's like, we all look at one another and we learn from one another and we say, oh, interesting. Well, that's why this vowel shape works so well for that type of singing. And that's Mm -hmm. why, you know, that's why we focus so much on breath here and why maybe there isn't as much focus on that in this genre. So it's, it's really, uh, it's an exciting time to be a voice teacher because there are so many things that are sort of like, it's sort of like so many new concepts and new scientific advancements to understand the physiology. It's been a really great time to sort of come up. (laughs) Yeah. And I do think that I mean, there is something about classical kind of teaching you to be uniform, right? I was talking to somebody the other day about this, about how, when you are coming up as a singer in the classical world, like they teach you to basically be a certain way, like a standard sound, have a certain standard sound and like fit in. Whereas I think in a lot of other genres, it's like, you want to accentuate your uniqueness and the parts of your voice that make you stand out. And so I would say for me, like I've been kind of working on that now as I become more of a pop singer is like, try to like beat a little bit out of myself of the, like trying to make myself sound a certain standardized way, like accentuating like the, you know, little quirks in my voice. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that like, again, just understanding that there's room for all of these genres and like, there's room for that and there's no right or wrong way, but like, you're right. It's, it's, um, it's definitely a more uniform classical singing is more uniform. There are ways, there are sort of, um, dimensions that you can differentiate yourself and sort of stand Mm -hmm. out. Absolutely. But I mean, there's no denying that in, in the, you know, pop and contemporary and, you know, uh, world that there's so much more room for that, um, you know, originality. Yeah. I mean, I, I came from also working at the opera, so I saw this with, uh, with all of our artists, you know, like you, you wanted them to be unique, but you also wanted them to sound a certain way. So yes. it was kind of a catch 22 a little bit for them, but yes. um, I definitely want to get into like the tool that you come up with to help singers be better singers. But first I want to talk about how you built this business of Songbird Studios from you teaching to like thinking I could have like a whole network of teachers that worked under me. And I know now you've gotten up to like 400 students in the San Francisco Bay area, which blows my mind. And you said something like 25 teachers, like how did you build up to that? Cause we don't just get up one day and go like, I think I'm going to build a network of 25 teachers that I manage. (laughs) You know, so what made you feel like I could do this? I know it was all sort of incremental and it it was born out of, um, you know, when I was teaching and I first moved to the Bay Area from New York and I sort of had a handful of students that I loved working with. And, you know, it was when I was I was outperforming, you know, in the evenings and I would teach during the day and my students, um, the singers I I was working with, they really wanted to perform. And, you know, I thought, well, there's obviously the traditional recital, you know, approach we could do that or we could do like, why don't I bring in professional musicians, like the band that I want to tour with, why don't I pay them and bring them? And we set up this whole rock show where all my singers get to perform one or two songs for each other. And so we, we started that out and immediately, like there was this realization that the magic was in the, the students connecting with one another and meeting each other and then being like, Oh, I want to sing on your song next time. Or, um, can I harmonize with you? Or have you ever written songs or maybe we should start a band. And I was just like, wow, this is so cool to see this, you know, energy and these people connecting and doing so much more with their connections, inspiring each other. And I realized immediately, well, my, my, if I'm just one teacher, it's very limiting, right? So it's only going to be so many teach, so many students that I can personally work with. And so that was where I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if I brought on one or two other teachers and just, you know, we could have these showcases together. But I was very specific about the approach that I wanted those teachers to take. Um, you know, I, again, I had been sort of like cautious. I didn't want to move. I didn't, I think that's in some areas, teachers can be more critical and, you know, like really, really rough on you if you don't practice and if you're not fitting in their box and all of that. And so I had this very specific way that I wanted my students to be supported. And it was all around like, you know, um, compassion and, and like kindness and giving them support and helping them 
I identify who they were and how they wanted to show up. And so there was like, I wanted to make sure that the teachers I brought on understood that approach and then also understood how to sing contemporary. And like, so I, it was just sort of like, I wanted, I wanted the control, if you will, of how it would go, you know, if I'm going to put my name, sure, your name's on it. Right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, and that was, it was 2014 that we started bringing on teachers, uh, I believe 2013 or 2014. And that's ultimately when we rebranded to Songbird Studios from my own personal teaching. And, you know, and I learned a lot very early on of the type of teachers I wanted to bring on. I, I toyed around with bringing on really experienced teachers versus bringing on teachers that weren't experienced, but that I could totally craft and like mold and like teach myself and, you know, ended up with a sort of like hybrid in the middle approach. But, um, you know, it, I had to learn a lot in those first few years of how to hire, what to look for, how to know that that person would be the right person to work with your studio and also how to let people go and mm, that's a fun <laughs> how to <one>. scale. <laughs> oh yeah. That, that was not fun. Um, it has not been a fun lesson, but I learned it. And I, you know, ultimately through the years have, um, I, I mean, I actually feel so genuinely appreciative and grateful for the the incredible team of people that Songbird Studios has become. We have, you know, we have a manager who I've been working with now for seven years and she's absolutely incredible. Um, you know, another events manager, marketing manager who we've been with for six years. A lot of our teachers have been with us for five, six, seven years now. Wow. And in this business, that is not common. It is not <laughs> right. common, you know, to see, I think teachers will stay for a year and then move on. And of course we have our teachers that turn over, but um, we have a really strong core group group of people who care about what we do. And so I just feel like I hit the jackpot, like finding these amazing human beings to work with. (laughs) That is so cool. Yeah. I was going to ask if you were managing all these teachers yourself, but it sounds like you've got people in there for managing, for marketing, uh, event coordination, like that's the smart way to do it. Did you have to do some of that stuff in the beginning and then slowly kind of scale up? Oh yeah. I have done every job at this studio. <laughs> like I have been, you know, I have been the administrator. I've done all the front desk work. Of course, then we brought in an amazing front desk team, like, and that that's, you know, grown. Um, now we've got three and they're fantastic, but, um, you know, but I, I did it all first and then slowly brought people on and would be like, does this work or how can we do this? And, um, you know, that delegation was really challenging to do like, as a as somebody like my, like, I kind of want everything to be done perfectly or in a certain way. And so it's really hard to let go, but I have two young children. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old now. And when I was pregnant with my first, um, with my first son, I knew like, okay, something's got to give here. Like, I'm not going to be able to get in and do everything the way that, you know, I have been. And so there were these sort of moments in time that became like, there was no other option other than to delegate. Mm -hmm. And I sort of just pushed myself to do that. I I had some really great mentors along the way that helped me do it. Some, you know, sort of like one of my students is this incredible business life coach. And Mm -hmm. I remember for my, as a gift, she gave me like a, you know, cons- like consulting sessions with me for my pregnancy, for like my, uh, as a gift for having my first child. And I swear she helped me so, so much. So it's just like, it's those moments along the way and you can choose to sort of like grow or you can choose to freak out and like tighten up. And so it's just like, you just got to keep pushing and keep growing. Yeah. I think we, we do need to be thankful for those moments because it's, we're at a crossroads, right. And we have to make this decision. Are we going to give up that like stranglehold control that we have over it because we, you know, want it to be a certain way. I remember somebody said to me recently, it was about a year ago, I think when I was like, I feel really uncomfortable, like giving up this piece and, you know, and they're like, well, why do you feel uncomfortable? Well, I know they're not going to do it as well as I am. And they're like, let me just tell you right now, they're not. Yeah. How can you be okay with that and move forward anyway? And I was like, (sighs) you know, like when I, I feel like in the past, people have said to me, well, you just need to find someone that can do it as well as you are better. Yeah. And, and I always felt like, well, I could never find that person, but them saying to me, like, guess what? They're not going to do it as well as you, but they're going to do it their way. And you're going to, you know, they're going to take the training that you give them and it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to, if you can live with that, then you're going to feel so much less stress. (laughs) 
And then it opens the door for you to do other things, yep. like to expand in new ways and, and create in new ways. If I had not done that, I never would have created the singing straw. I wouldn't be launching the course I'm doing now. Like there's, if I wasn't comfortable with that, like I would be, you know, totally breaking my back trying to do it all. <laughs> and it's not to say I'm not still involved. I'm still very involved, but I'm involved in a way that I can trust my, you know, my team and the people that I, I know and love. And we work together. We, we respect one another. We cover for each other when things get hard, you know, we take vacations. So it's actually like so beautiful to work with a group of people. I mean, if there's all the fears and there's of course the negatives and the challenges of like, you know, managing people and a team and all of that. And I get it, but I, for me, the benefits of like constantly learning from them, being inspired by them, like that, um, being able to lean on them that far, far outweighs, um, the challenges, right? Yeah. Oh, I absolutely love that. So do you guys have a physical location or are these teachers going out like all over the Bay area? And then you kind of have like meetings on zoom or how does that work? We have three physical locations in San Francisco, actually. Wow. I know. And that, and so that started in 2014, we had, we opened our first studio. And again, this comes down to me being very like specific and perfectionist. And my husband, um, now husband at the time, he was just my boyfriend, but we sort of built a uh, songbird together. He's been very involved in the team and, um, he and I like had a very specific vision for how we wanted the studios to look and to feel when you showed up. And so that was a big part of it was like our, our physical space. Mm -hmm. And so we, we started with one location in Knob Hill, uh, about two years later, we opened a second location in Noe Valley. And then um, about a year and a half after that opened our third location, in the sunset. So we have 12 teaching rooms in total. And then of course, when COVID hit, <laughs> that like just turned everything upside down and on its head. And um, we moved to fully remote teaching uh, overnight. I mean, and I thought, I remember in March of 2020 thinking, guys, it'll be one week. We'll be back two weeks, you know? <laughs> it's just like so hilarious that it was two, almost two full years. But we are now, and so what's very interesting and fun about that. And I'm, I'm choosing to look at it in this sort of like positive way. It's like now, you know, four or five of our teachers have moved and, you know, life has like, either, like moved locations, moved cities, moved towns. And so we still have our big team, but um, you know, there's a number of them that are going to be fully remote forever. So we now mm. have this sort of like remote teaching arm and we've been able to work with students. Students were able to come back that had moved, you know, and they were like, oh my gosh, I get to work with my teacher again. This is amazing. Like it was actually really cool to see that happen. So we are now though, going back in person, those of us who are in the Bay area, we are going back. So we basically have now a hybrid model of in studio and online lessons. That's awesome. Yeah. I've heard this story from a few people. Like we would never have done this, but we had to do it. And now it's just becoming another part of our business. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I never would have gone online. Never, ever in a million years. Even though I personally teach online all the time because my artists are traveling and stuff, but it was like, you know, and it's just, it's just one of those obvious instances where you learn, oh my gosh, you know, the world pushed me, the universe pushed me. I had to adjust and now I'm so much better for it, you know? Yep. So you, you are still teaching. How, how often do you still teach? You know, um, it, it kind of ebbs and flows through the years. Uh, cause as I grew songbird, I had so much more management and like administrative sort of work and setting up the structure and all of that. So at the time, I think I was maybe teaching like one or two days a week back before I hired teachers, I was, I was teaching five days a week. So mm -hmm. I was like a full <laughs> schedule and then it ebbed. And then I had my kids. And so then it was sort of like, okay, we'll do, uh, I settled on sort of one day a week for a few years. And then, you know, as the singing straw, you know, we produced this product and sort of put that to launch. And um, my husband and I launched that brand and that's been kind of crazy. Um, I actually sort of, I probably throughout that time maintained a day or a day and a half a week of teaching. And mm -hmm. then this past winter, I um, took a little hiatus away um, and I just told all my students, I love you. I'll be back, you know, in the early spring, but I'm launching a course and I want to get out there and I want it. So I wanted to sort of give this course launch for my love your voice course, um, a hundred percent of my attention. And so I'm wrapping that first round up right now. And it's, yeah. So just kind of ebbs and flows though. I always teach. There's no way I won't, you know, it's mm. part of who I am, but I think it will evolve and the types of students I work with will evolve and just all of it just continues to move. <laughs> 
Totally. Oh gosh, you have you have so many things that you're doing, which is is great that you've got this team so you can really explore all these other things. And I know we met because of your Love Your Voice course. How has that been? Like, how, what was that experience like versus teaching in person? Totally challenging. Like mm-hmm. it was, it really just put me in this new, I, I just got to look at the, what I was doing and how I was training people in a completely new lens through a completely new lens. And so, you know, I, and so it kind of was born from, um, the singing straw. So, um, and this goes back to sort of like the science, <laughs> all of that cutting edge science stuff I was talking about. It's like, there's all these new developments that are happening in the voice world and straphonation is one of those things. So, and I had kind of been introduced to straphonation years ago and it really clicked for me, but there weren't any sustainable eco-friendly, convenient options out there for singers. So um, I used to stock these little plastic coffee stirring straws in all of our studios, <laughs> which, you know, they used to be easy to find. And then San Francisco banned plastic straws. Right. And, you know, it's kind of like, okay, well now what am I going to do? And, um, you know, I could find all these reusable straws, but they're all way too big because size actually really makes a difference in terms of the impact of straw phonation on the vocal folds as to how much benefit you get. And so it's just funny. I think it was 2018 or 2018, 2019, where my husband and I were just kind of daydreaming about our upcoming year and the things we wanted to do. And I just was like, you know what? I'm going to make the singing star. Like I'm going to make something <laughs> that, that people can use for straw foundation because there really isn't a product out there that works. That's affordable that like anyone can use. And so that was kind of how it was born. And because, um, it was just funny because singing star, I thought, you know, be like a few voice nerds like me who liked it, maybe songbird students. I didn't think it would be anything huge. And it just blew up like Mm. very quickly. I just had all these people around the world, like reaching out, being like, oh my God, I love straw phonation. I'm so excited to have a kit. I'm so excited. And I was like, so how did it blow up? Like, were you doing it on social media and people found out about it or, you know, I've started with my teaching network. Like I have a, a, I've basically like a, a network of like 50 or so teach teachers that I have been involved with for th- through the years. And, um, they're all sort of like, we call ourselves, you know, voice nerds or like, just like mm-hmm. total, like singing dorks. And, um, I just, yeah, that was me in college. Saying, I definitely called myself a voice nerd. Yes, exactly. And I just started by sharing it with them being like, Hey guys, like, can I send you one? Like, are you interested? And they were so excited and they were just like, Oh, I love the case. I love the bag. I love that there's three. I love all of this. And so they started sharing it with their students. And we just, so we had this sort of like, we just organically started an affiliate program, um, which just like, that was the first thing that sort of scaled the business. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, I started a YouTube channel, um, because I had a lot of people asking, okay, great. Now I have it, but like, how do I use it? Like, talk to me about what do I do? What are the exercises? And I was like, well, the easiest way is for me to just put these out on, on YouTube and people can watch. And between that and Instagram and TikTok, things just started moving and we, you know, sort of reached a lot more people, which has been awesome. Um, and so that's sort of like how the course was born because Mm. I thought, well, wow, I really want to work with these singers more and how can I help them? Like, well, I don't have time to do one-on-ones at all of them. And, you know, Songbird only has so much capacity. So like, what can I do? And, and ultimately um, moving to, you know, a course format was, was what I sort of thought, this is the answer. You know, this is how I can reach more people and help more singers and teach them how to use a singing straw and then teach them how to love love their voice. Mm, That's very cool how that all worked synergistically together. Um, First of all, what made you think that you could create a product. Like for me, that seems so overwhelming. I mean, I know. that's just funny the way that I say that, like, obviously you've already done it. Like, but what made you think that you, like, I think about it and I'm like, there's so many facets to creating a product. It sounds like super overwhelming. I know. And that's funny you ask that now. Cause looking back, I'm like, you're right. It's totally crazy. Who did I think I was? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I had a baby. I was just like, what am I? But I just, I, I guess I was just sort of naturally following. I, I, there's a piece of me that has always been a big dreamer. Mm. Like I always have had big dreams and, you know, they don't always met, like uh, come to life in the exact way that I dream them, but like things always tend to evolve and amazing things happen. And I think like just having a belief in yourself that like you can make a difference in people's lives and you can do things that will help people and you can, you know, um, you can achieve big things like that has like having that belief, no matter what that looks like, I think has really helped me to 
to make crazy decisions like that. Cause it was ultimately, and I mean, when I look back, it was like, Oh, it was just a small step-by-step thing. My husband and I were talking, we do this annual thing where every year around new year's Eve, we look ahead at the coming year and we talk about our goals and our dreams and what would be, what would be so cool if we did. And that's where the like concept of the singing straw came it was like, well, let's, let's make a reusable option. Let's make a cool, sustainable kit. Like let's make it fun for singers. Let's make it easy for them to use. And, you know, it was just like one step at a time. I was like, okay, well let's explore um, prototyping it. And then it was like, okay, now that we've found our, like, exactly what we want, let's design the, the logo and the brand and let's, you know, secure a manufacturer and let's, you know, and then we started literally by shipping them outside of our house. Like I just, we were like, well, let's order a bunch of envelopes and we'll ship them out ourselves. And, you know, now it's grown and we've got them stocked in warehouses and, you know, we're not doing all of that like work, but it was, it's a really fun, amazing process. And it taught me so much. E-commerce is a completely different world. Oh my gosh. I know. That's what I think about. I'm like, I can't even think about getting into e-commerce and like finding, like you said, finding a manufacturer, like where would I, I even start? Oh yeah. It helps that my husband and I work together as a team. Cause like, I couldn't do it all myself. And he right. definitely like took over more of the manufacturing supply chain side of, cause he's sort of like on top of that now, which mm-hmm. has been helpful, but man, yeah, I, it's, it, it's funny, but if you just do it, if you just look at one step at a time, it's just like, okay, it just will naturally evolve the way it's supposed to, I think. Yeah, no, that's cool. Very brave. I love all these big, brave leaps that you've taken throughout your career. And I know that, you know, a lot of people listening or watching, they feel a little bit overwhelmed by social media and how do they get themselves out there without spending forever on social media. And so I'm curious when you decided to like, do these kinds of tutorials and and things about the singing straw, like, did you batch a bunch of that? Like, how did you fit that into all the other stuff you're doing. I know. And honestly, like, I still think I have a long way to go in terms of like perfecting it. Like Mm -hmm. I know I see other creators, um, who are so consistent and just so creative and I love it. But I think, you know, for me, it was like, I would focus on sort of one thing at a time and then try to perfect a process that could be replicated that was sustainable. Mm -hmm. So for me, that first piece was, okay, let's do a YouTube channel. So let's do one video a week. Um, you know, let's make them short workout videos. And, you know, that was like, we kind of probably took a few months to figure out our setup. I mean, we started filming with my iPhone, you know, and then Mm -hmm. it was like, and then my husband, who's a photographer um, and videographer, he kind of was like, well, let's step it up. Like, let's get this camera and let's do this. And we've got these lights. And so we kind of perfected the setup and then it was like, all right, now we're going to, that's when we started batching. It was like, once we got our sort of format, it was like, okay, let's do all of our videos that, you know, for the whole month, this day. And, you know, that happened. And then a few months later, once that groove happened, I moved towards like, I just got excited about TikTok and started playing. (laughs) And that came from a playful, like I'm having fun here. And that just sort of like, kind of that, like once I just had fun and just showed up in a positive way, there was sort of like a natural momentum that started there as well. Um, but I think, you know, if you look at, <laughs> there's always room to grow and there's always room to improve and there's always going to be, you know, somebody else who's doing more consistent content or more creative content or more exciting content or more engaged content. It's like, if you look at it from that perspective, you're going to feel like, oh, why do I even, where do I even start? Don't do it. Just, it's like, but if you look at it more from the perspective of like, okay, what is most beneficial to my business or my artistry right now? Like which, which, um, medium do I actually want to spend time on Twitter? Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's Facebook, maybe it's Instagram, maybe it's Snapchat, whatever it is. And then start there and being like, just be yourself. Then you can branch out, you know, once you then get a format, you can get comfortable, but you got to start from what's natural and authentic. Cause no matter which medium you're on, which social media channel you're on, people respond to you being you. Yeah. And so it's like, if you're trying to be someone else who's successful on Instagram, then they're not going to, it's not going to resonate with anybody because you're trying to be someone else. So it's just like, find a way to show up that is authentic to you. And then the natural magnetism of like, you know, that will, will draw in your fans or your supporters or your audience. Oh yeah. I totally agree. I totally agree. I think that there are ways that we can fit this into our schedule. And like you said, if you get excited about it, that's the best, right? Because then you're just like this, you're flowing, like all these ideas are flowing that you want to put out there. 
And that's the best thing that happens, but we're not always in that state. So like being totally. able to batch and and think strategically about the content that we want to put out there is going to make life so much easier. Definitely. Totally agree. It's a combo, right? Like yep. you want to get in the flow. You want to learn what works. You want to find your small audience to start with. And then it's like, cool, how do I standardize this? And then it does become about consistency. And that's where like the batch work and the like team, all of that can be really, really helpful. Yeah, for sure. Well, this has all been so awesome. I've loved talking about all these different facets of your business. I know everybody is going to be inspired by all the ways that you've scaled and the things that you've added. And, you know, just seeing that it started with you being an artist and then just teaching a few people on the side yeah, and growing yeah. into this, you know, I think it's really <laughs> inspiring. So I'd love for you to let everybody know, like, how can they find you on YouTube? How can they find out more about the singing straw and, you know, all the things. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, you can find out about the singstraw, singstraw.com. It's super simple. And our YouTube channel is mm -hmm. youtube.com slash singingstraw. That's where you'll find tons of tutorials. I walk you through answering questions, getting started, the whole thing, I talk about the science and why it works. So those are really great places to get started. If you're thinking, well, straw formation, could that help my voice? Like, what could that do for me? And it really does. Like I, I have yet to meet a singer that it doesn't amaze, like transform their voice. Um, and then you can find, uh, information around songbird studios it's songbirdsf.com um and don't let that name fool you or url fool you because we are teaching around the world so <laughs> it's not just sf and then you can follow me on tiktok at not your basic vocal coach <laughs> and whitney sings on instagram so <laughs> love it i love all those handles well thank you so much this has been such a fun episode to record with you awesome thank you Brie, for having me this is awesome Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 